All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Bronwyn Strong. I want to welcome you to the Natural History Society of Maryland tonight. Tonight, we're going to learn about map turtles. And it is so exciting and my pleasure to have Dr. Richard Siegel and Zoe Huff here, Towson students and Towson uh, professor, to talk about their work with map turtles in Maryland. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Siegel now. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us, a community of the curious. Well, it's my genuine pleasure. And while I get my screen set up, uh, which hopefully everybody will be able to see, I just want to A, thank the society for having uh, invited us and for all of you today for coming. Uh, looking forward to interacting with you, looking to more interactions down the road. Um, I also want to do a shout out very quickly because in watching the people coming on board, I have four colleagues who are here uh, from Towson, uh, Faith Week, Sarah Cook, Brett Wilson, and Nancy Defoe. And quick shout out to you guys for coming on and watching us so you can see exactly what we're, we're, we're up to. Sarah, of course, is a student who's worked on this project for a number of years. And uh, these other folks I'm sure are gonna have a, a good time, but I really appreciate the colleagues coming out and talking to us. So can everyone see my screen? Everyone see the, the natural, the unique conservation story we're about to tell you. So this talk is gonna be in two parts. Uh, I'm going to give the introduction to it. I'm going to talk about the biology, the ecology, and the conservation biology of the turtle sort of in a big picture sense. And then Zoe, who is my undergraduate research student, is going to give you some details about the work that we've been doing in collaboration with the town of Port Deposit, which is a big part of the conservation story here in Maryland. So with that being said, let's start off with saying, what are map turtles? Um, for those of you who are in the Herp Club, you're probably already aware of this. But map turtles are a really diverse group of turtles. Um, there are at least 15 species, more if you want to have a different view of the taxonomy. But 15 species, they range from very small to rather large in the case of our own northern map turtle. Um, some of them are extremely attractive, like uh, this beast up here in the upper left-hand corner and this guy in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, generally, they are entirely aquatic turtles found mainly in river systems is where we typically find them. You also find them in large lakes like Lake Erie. And as a group, they are heavily impacted as of course are unfortunately most of our turtles. Uh, they are heavily impacted by humans in a negative way. Uh, in the case of map turtles, the biggest uh, areas of concern are over collection for the pet trade. Uh, a number of these species are very, very popular on the pet trade, both within the United States and internationally. Um, I used to work on one of these beasts down here in the middle right in the Mississippi, uh, southeastern corner of Mississippi, called the yellow blotched map turtle. And collectors used to come every year from Europe to collect uh, eight to 10 of these turtles, which they would sell in Europe for $2,000 each. And that would fund their trip to the United States was just going out and collecting eight or 10 of these. Uh, these are on CITES, which as many of you know is the International Trade Agreement and Endangered Species, but they're also threatened by pollution. And of course, as is true for most turtles are threatened by habitat loss. So generally speaking, not doing terribly well as a group, although certainly better than some turtles. Um, our northern map turtle is this beastie here in the lower right hand corner. It's not the most attractive of all the species, but we think it's a pretty handsome animal. We enjoy working with it. Um, this is a state endangered species. In Maryland, it's found only in the Susquehanna River and the immediately adjacent streams, particularly Broad Creek and Deer Creek. Uh, we started our research here. We're now going into our 13th year of doing research with map turtles here in Maryland. Uh, we were approached in 2008 by Maryland DNR which effectively said to us, well, we don't even know if this state endangered species still exists in Maryland. No one has done a status survey since the early 1980s. So it was uh, almost 25 years since the last status survey was done. So they said, go out there, see if you can still find these animals. And if they're here, see if they're here in enough numbers to maybe do some ecological research. So my wife and I, and then eventually a graduate student uh, began doing our research again about 13 years ago. 
We eventually got funding from DNR, the State Highway Administration, Exelon, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we found some important, interesting things about the turtle. First of all, they are, in fact, confined, as you can see from this slide, to the Susquehanna River. Uh, they are both upstream and downstream of the Conowingo Dam. And I'm sure if you're not familiar with the Conowingo Dam, you should be. It's one of the most important ecological environmental features in Maryland, both on a positive and a negative side. Um, the Conowingo Dam subdivides the range of the map turtle in Maryland almost exactly in half. Uh, south of the dam, we did a series of radio telemetry studies from about 2008 to 2011. Uh, for those of you not familiar with radio telemetry, it's one of the most fun things to do. This is my first graduate student here in the upper left hand corner. This is Teal Rich Richards Dimitri. She was our ambassadoress of map turtles in Maryland for the first three years of the study. And she spent most of her waking hours putting transmitters on the backs of our turtles and then following them up and down the Susquehanna River. And here's the kind of data that you get from radio telemetry studies that gave us a good indication of what map turtles are doing downstream of the dam. So you see here, you have one turtle here in yellow. That's each dot represents its movement over a series of days. This fellow, this uh, girl spent most of her time between what we call the island complex, which is immediately adjacent to Susquehanna State Park, for those of you who are familiar with this part of the river. So this is a group of three islands and the turtles are found mainly in between the islands where the water level is more consistent and less turbulent than it is in the main river stem. But some turtles like this uh, girl here in red would spend some time between the islands and then take off to go other places. And what this girl did is stop in port deposit to nest and then head down near Aberdeen and then come back to Port Deposit and go back down to Aberdeen and then go back up to uh, the island complex. But basically most of our turtles are found right up in here between these three islands immediately adjacent to Susquehanna State Park. Some of them go upstream to nest, some of them go downstream to nest. Upstream of the dam, uh, we find the turtles mainly in Broad Creek. And if you're familiar with Broad Creek, it's a, uh, a really nice habitat does have a lot of human use impact, but our turtles seem to be very happy to live with the people in Broad Creek. And each of these areas that you see in these circles are clusters of where map turtles are found in Broad Creek. And so these are the two big areas we find the turtles, upstream of the dam and Broad Creek, downstream of the dam between the island complexes is the, the main places that you find our turtles. Uh, one of the main things that we looked at in, in dealing with turtles was uh, their diet. And one of the big things about their diet is that map turtles are sexually dimorphic. And so if you're not familiar with sexual dimorphism, this is one of the most extreme examples in all of turtles. This is a male turtle up above. This is a fully grown female down below. This male is a, about 10% of the mass of the female. And in case you're wondering, yes, this female can in fact make sure this female, this male can get as much sperm as these females need to inseminate about 40 eggs per year. Uh, that's a, it's an interesting thing, but that's as big as a male gets, his little tiny guy up above. This results in some really big differences in diet. Um, these things eat completely different things. Males eat aquatic insects almost entirely. Females eat mussels. They have these expanded heads as you can see here in the middle of the slide, their heads are huge compared to the tiny little head of the male. And what they eat are mainly mussels. And one of the big things that we found in doing our research is this is one of the few native predator on the invasive zebra mussel. If those of you have heard about zebra mussels and all of the environmental issues that zebra mussels cause, uh, our female map turtles are become largely specialists on zebra mussels. This is their preferred prey item. Uh, we're not trying to pretend that they could control zebra mussels because I think that would be a stretch, but they are one of the few native predators that actually take zebra mussels. So if people ever ask you what a turtle is good for, here's a good example. Um, one of our issues we're going to turn to now is management issues, things that on a conservation scale we've been looking at that things that we think impact the biology and behavior of the turtle and how we've solved those issues in collaboration with the federal, state, and Exelon agencies. 
Um, the most likely way that you're going to see a map turtle is when they do basking. And again, for the people in the Herp Club, you will know this, but for those who aren't familiar, reptiles, of course, are solar powered. They get their heat energy from the sun. They can't generate their own internal heat energy. So when turtles need to raise their body temperature for digestion and for reproductive reasons, they're going to spend their time in the sun so they can raise their body temperature. So this is an essential component of their behavior. And one of the ways you're going to see map turtles is by watching them bask. And this is a very easy way if you want to come out to the Susquehanna River and use a spotting scope or even a pair of binoculars, you've got a pretty good shot at seeing turtles because they're so conspicuous while they bask. Unfortunately, because there's so much human activity in the Susquehanna River, um, they're also very likely to be disturbed by humans during these basking events. Um, the biggest issue we have are actually kayakers. Um, people who we would normally think of as being very environmentally conscious are actually a major threat to turtle behavior. Because what happens is kayakers, of course, want to see wildlife, so they move very slowly. They creep along, and if there's a map turtle basking on these rocks and they're being approached stealthily by this person in a kayak, what's going to happen is the turtles will interpret that as a predator trying to approach them, and they will dive off into the water. And the problem with this is the body temperature that these turtles like to get up to is well over about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The water temperature is about 68. And as soon as they plunge back into the water, they lose all of their body temperature gain that they got from basking. And this situation is so serious in the river during the spring while the females in particular are out basking to get their reproductive systems geared up for laying eggs. The mean time between being disturbed is 11 minutes on the Susquehanna River. In other words, a turtle can bask undisturbed for no more than about 11 minutes at a time. And then it goes off and spends five or 10 minutes in the water and then comes back onto land. And then 11 minutes later, it gets disturbed. So this is one of the more serious issues that the turtles are facing. It's not unique to our population of northern map turtles. It happens in other map turtles around the United States but it's particularly conspicuous because we have so much human activity here in the Susquehanna River. Another thing that impacts the turtles while basking is the Conowingo Dam. Uh, the Conowingo Dam affects basking in a very significant way because it changes the water levels in the river depending on whether the dam is releasing water for electrical generation. On the right, it's not a great photograph. It was taken from one of our game cameras. Um, this picture on the left here, this one I'm circling, is a bunch of female map turtles on the top of a basking rock, all very nicely clustered together, getting their sun. What happens is, is that when the dam releases water for electrical purposes, it raises the water level in the river in just a matter of 15 minutes to a half an hour. This is the same rock taken 30 minutes later, and you can see that there's virtually nothing exposed of the rock, and the turtles are clinging to the top of the rock the way survivors would of a sinking liner in the ocean. And so what happens is, is that we have to find a solution to this, and Exelon did a great job in funding us to do this. And what we did is we created a series of basking platforms that we could anchor to these rocks, these rise and fall with the river level. So even when the water levels are high, the turtles still have a safe place to bask. Because this is one of the few cases where we have found in terms of doing wildlife management where you can find a technological solution to what appears to be a fairly complex problem. And these basking platforms are going to be deployed in increasing numbers in the, Savannah, in the Susquehanna River over the next couple of three years. The problem with that solution, as good as it sounds, is it doesn't do anything for boaters. Uh, in other words, the disturbance that we get from boaters is still going to be an issue. And in fact, to show the complexity of the issue, uh, we think that people are actually going to be attracted to these platforms because they're going to see wildlife using them. So they're going to want to try to get closer. So how we can educate our kayakers to stay away from these platforms to avoid disturbing the wildlife is one of the issues we have not yet dealt with. Hey, um, Richard, um, how long does the turtle have to bask to reach the level of warmth they need, at least essentially? Depends on the time of day and the intensity of the sun. 
So if it's a nice sunny day in early June and it's 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock or one o'clock, probably not more than about a half an hour or 45 minutes. But if it's a cool day in early to mid May and there's partly cloudy, it might take an hour or two or perhaps even three to really get up to what we call an optimal body temperature. So it really depends on the time of day and the intensity of the sun. And they're really using the basking platforms, Nancy asked. They use them immediately. Uh, that picture down on the bottom on the basking platform was taken, I think, on the second day that after we deployed it. They're very opportunistic. Lynn can tell you this, I think, from her observations down uh, at the marina where she's seen her turtles. Well, they'll bask. This is the idea that we got is, is when a debris comes downstream, they'll start basking on a new log that's only been in place for a few days. And that gave us the idea that, hey, if they'll be opportunistic like that and bask on new objects, maybe they would bask on these platforms as well. The biggest problem we actually have with the platforms, it was a big engineering feat to get them anchored to rocks in the river. Um, the Exelon had to hire an engineering firm to actually drill these massive holes in these rocks to have anchors so that these platforms wouldn't wash away the first time that water levels came out from the dam, rose from the dam. Any other questions about the basking platforms? Not at this time. Okay. So the last thing we're going to talk about, probably the most serious issue, the one that we're most invested in doing research, has to do with nest survival. Uh, map turtles historically as a group nest on sandbars. This is a picture actually taken at my study site in southern Mississippi. Um, this is a typical riverside sandbar. This is on the Pascagoula River in southeastern Mississippi. Um, typically on rivers that are not dammed, these sandbars are regenerated by uh, sand washed from upstream. You'll get high water, it'll deposit sand, it keeps the vegetation off, and there's always open sand for the turtles to nest. The problem with the Susquehanna River, it's downstream of the dam, is that we don't have that anymore. We don't get sandbar creation anymore. All of that silt and sand that would have created sandbars is all being sequestered upstream by the dams. So now the turtles nest on old remnant sandbars that have not had sand deposition in decades. And they also nest on islands in the river. And as you're gonna see when Zoe does her talk in port deposit. Uh, this is an old sandbar on the Susquehanna River now. You can see it's encroached by vegetation on both sides. We actually clear this manually every year that we do our research here to keep it at least somewhat open. But you can see it's a very different area in terms of shading than what you get in Mississippi. The problem with this is multiple, but the part we're gonna talk about today is what it does is the turtles really want to nest in these open areas. And because there aren't many of them, the nests become very concentrated. And as a result, they become highly vulnerable to predators. Uh, in a nest area like this, we'll get as many as 200 nests created in a single year. That's a very high density of nests in a very small area. What happens to those nests? We have to try to see if our technology is going to work. I have to stop my sharing and then redo my screen share. So I have to share a different part of my screen. This is what happens to our nests. This is your friend and my friend, the raccoon. This is pictures taken with our game cameras at 10 o'clock in the morning, typically where you would not see raccoons being active. This nest was 16 minutes old. It had been built by a, rac by a female turtle 16 minutes ago. It took 16 minutes for the raccoon to find that nest, roll her first egg out of the nest, break the egg open as you see the raccoon doing now, swallow the egg contents. And when the raccoon is done with that, gets a nice little juicy, a uh, meal from it. She's going to go back to the nest, as you're going to see in just a second, and dig up the nest egg. Pose for the camera for a second, and then dig up the nest, nest, next egg. So let me pause this and go back to my other spot. What this means is what we find is that, oops, Oops. Uh, the nest success is very low here. Uh, we've been tracking this since about 2011 through both direct observations from having students in blinds, as some of my students here like Sarah can tell you. And what we found is that virtually 100% of our nests are destroyed by predators. 
Uh, the last year that we did this, 99.6% of the nests were destroyed by raccoons. Out of about 180 nests that were created at the sandbars, we had two nests that survived, the raccoons. So this is typically what we see is here in the lower right-hand corner. So this is a major issue. Uh, we've done some extensive population modeling of the turtle populations here, and these nest success rates are much, much too low to support a viable population. The population of map turtles in the Susquehanna River will reach near extinction levels, what we call quasi-extinction levels, in approximately 40 to 50 years if this is not changed. So this is a major conservation wildlife management issue. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, it's Bronwyn again. Is it, it, Lynn wants to know, do map turtles nest in the same place every year? They have very high what we call nest site fidelity. Uh, we have individual females who during a single year will come back within just a few meters of where they nested earlier in the year. And we have particularly in port deposit, we've got some of our best data. We have individual females who in three or four years of nesting have nested in about a five meter wide area. So yes, they have very high nest fidelity. They come back to the same site year after year. So what do we do about this? Well, this is even worse than you think. Here's a really nice cute picture on the right of a hatchling map turtle. One of the things that map turtles do that makes them fairly unique is they do what we call overwintering in the nest where the hatchlings actually emerge from the eggs about 60 days after they're laid in early to mid June, but don't emerge from the nest chamber until the following spring. So they spend the entire winter underground they don't come up and see the light of day from June of, let's say, 2020 until May or April of 2021. And the reason is, is that if you're a tiny little turtle, like this little guy here on the left, you can imagine how well you would survive in the Susquehanna River if you emerged in August or early September and then had to face winter flooding. That would not be a good thing. So they usually they spend the winter in the nests. The problem is, is that if we get winter flooding that floods the nesting grounds, which has happened to us on multiple occasions, our nests, even though they are safe from predators by cages that we put on them, the nests are subject to flooding. So what do you do about this? Well, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide because we're actually running late. I can talk about this in more detail later, but we had three options of what to do. We could either control the predators we could put cages on the nest to protect them to the predators, or we could transplant the nests to a isolated hatchery where we could raise the eggs in complete uh, safety from any predators. The pros and cons of all of these are listed here again, because we're running late. I wanna make sure we give Zoe enough time to do her segment. I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but this gives you an example of how complex wildlife management can be. There are multiple options. There are pros and code cons for each option. And how we do this depends on funding and public reaction. But what we wound up doing and what we're still doing now and hopefully with Exelon in this year is we are protecting the nests using cages. And so what we do here where it's labeled graph A, what we do is we put a wire mesh cover over each one of our nests as we see them being created because we're out at these nesting sites basically 20, well not 24 seven, but seven days a week during daylight hours. When we see a nest being created, we put and stake a wire mesh cover over the nest site. This is over 90% effective at stopping the predators from taking the nests. About two months or three months later, we'll put a cage over the nest, also made of wire mesh. This allows the hatchlings to emerge the following spring but the predators still can't get at them. And what we do is we come by in April and May, we pick up the hatchlings, we measure them, we mark them, we bring them down to the river and we get them into the river safely from being uh, taken by predators. So this works relatively well, but it requires about 120 staff hours per week for about 10 weeks. So it's extremely expensive in staffing time and unfortunately doesn't do anything to prevent mortality from flooding as we saw in the last two years where we did this research. So like most stories in wildlife management, simple answers don't exist. All of our answers are nuanced and complex. 
So with that being said, I am going to turn this over to Zoe to talk about the next part of the study, which is port deposit. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Rich. And so I'm going to share my screen now. Um, Ashley, Rich, can you stop sharing your screen so I can yes, share mine? Yes, I am going to do that right now. Perfect. All right. Perfect. And let me go to mine. Awesome. All righty. Cool. So again, my name is Zoe Huff. Um, I'm a student at Towson University, and I'm going to be talking about the public engagement of the Maryland northern map turtles. All right. So let's begin. Um, in 2008, as Rich was saying, um, this is the start of the project, and so this is approached by Maryland Department of Natural Resources and uh, to do a population study. And from that, they found that a critical nesting site was uh, the town of Port Deposit itself. And so it was understanding the river and how the turtles were able to use the river, um, but definitely did find that the town of Port Deposit was really critical. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more, but this led to um, a lot of conservation partnerships. Um, and some of those partnerships include the town of Port Deposit itself, Exelon, um, Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Tom Landings Marina, among a couple others. And so those um, partnerships really kind of came after the start of the project. So from 2008, 2012 around. And then in 2013, you can see the beautiful, um, Tom Gas House right here on the screen right over here. Um, and so this became the base of the research, the environmental education and uh, visitor center uh, for the project. And so from 2013 to present day, um, research was still being conducted and then outreach through the um, gas house was also being conducted. And so um, it, allowed this area has a living shoreline which is like the only area within the town limits that has a living shoreline so if you want to call it kind of a beach which is a allows um an easier way for the turtles to access the land and so it's really helpful for nesting and then um continuing on Oops. sorry about that all right, and so why port deposit? Why is port deposit so important to this project? And so what was discovered from the um, initial uh, research and research continuing on is that there are other areas of the Susquehanna River that um, the map turtles do go to as a nesting site. But, um, and while those are more primary sites um, and they are quote unquote natural, so this is, um, away from direct human interference and also has a more natural scene. Um, they are really high with uh, predation as you just saw the video with the raccoon. Um, but the sites at um, in the town of Port Deposit, while there are fewer females that go and nest there, so there's typically about five to eight females who habitually nest there, um, they do have a higher success rate um, for their nest because they are unaffected by predation. And so, what they are impacted by is the human interaction because the town itself is a waterfront town. And so there's a lot of human disturbances there. And so this next slide that I'm gonna show you right here, um, this video does not have sound, but I do wanna play it. I think it demonstrates what the turtles really do encounter while being in a town and urban area. So right here, you can see our little turtle friend little turtle female friend walking in between the tires of a trailer and so she is in a parking lot just making her way back to the water awesome yeah so that turtle was ooh, that turtle's name is Rhonda. And so um, Rhonda in 2014 became the, the town's official mascot. And so um, she was seen dodging trucks, um, making her way across the parking lot after she would uh, nest each year. And so in that parking lot was from the town's mar um, landing marina. And so there was a employee whose name was Ronnie, but because she is a female, the name got switched to Rhonda. And so, um, uh, the signs and like 
symbols that you can see over here on the right hand side of my screen. Um, these can be seen throughout the entire town of Port Deposit as a marketing effort. And so having Rhonda as the town mascot really helps promote ecotourism by att attracting visitors, driving economic growth and um, allowing the protection and bringing awareness to the map turtles themselves. So that's really awesome there. And so um, there was a need to have a public in, uh, involvement through education and awareness um, because the town is a critical uh, nesting site for the success and the viability of this population. Um, so during the summer months when the turtles are like at their peak season, uh, the humans are as well. And so, as I said earlier, it is a waterfront town. So there's boating, fishing, kayaking, waterfront restaurants, all accessible to the public. And so um, while there's the increased activity on both sides, it allows for a higher chance of interaction and conflict arising. And so um, there definitely did, needed to be a um, chance for increased awareness and education because those interactions were bound to happen. And with that, there can lead to mortality of the females themselves or the hatchlings um, just from foot traffic or other disturbances from humans. And so um, the town really did come together and supported the map turtles as it is a co-beneficiary um, project. So while there's ecotourism, there's also the fact of protecting an endangered um, state turtle, which is really awesome. So this is typically not seen in conservation biology where both sides are working towards the same goal of protecting the species. So it's really awesome and it did work in this instance. And so the town, again, definitely did embrace this having their state endangered friend and really being able to adapt and coexist with them. And then, so with that, by involving the public, there are a couple of community-based approaches to conservation management um, that really has worked and um, like helped in this instance. And so these include awareness that local knowledge is priceless, um, being a presence, and then social media and networking. And so, going with that. Um, first one up is that locals know their town. And so um, they, the locals are really able to contribute great information to the project and have contributed great information. Um, they, they're able to have an eyes on the town on a daily basis, whereas representatives from the project aren't there on a daily basis. And so that knowledge has been a really key aspect of this. And so um, citizens definitely have alerted representatives of like unideal nesting grounds, as you can see from this image over on the most right hand side, um, where it says keep off turtle nesting area. And so um, over the years, Port Deposit definitely has been um, informed and educated about the presence and importance of the turtles and learn what to do with turtle sightings. And so you can see from this infographic on this side, um, they're just reviewing the steps of what people should expect, uh, what they should do or what not to do when seeing a turtle. Um, and just to save a little bit of time, I'm not gonna go through it completely, but the gist of it is if you see a turtle, let the turtle do its turtle thing. Like they know the best, like turtles know how to live their turtle life. And so um, kind of leave it be, um, unless it's an immediate danger, then if it's in uh, the road, if it's on the train tracks that run through poor deposit, um, then like that's a time to maybe uh, interject, but otherwise let the turtle be its turtle self. And then also um, it can be found on our so social media. So you can go there for more information on that. Um, but then it's also just really important to have people know enough about the science and um, be able to anticipate interactions and understand what to do in those situations because it is bound to happen as you know it is right on the water there are um, turtles that come in on a good on a good basis and so um, it, it's important that citizens know how to handle those interactions and so um, the citizen knowledge kind of take took a, the form of a citizen science, if you want to call it that. Um, and so again, from this image over here that I was just 
pointing out, um, this is actually from a condo complex that's right past Lee's uh, Landing. Um, and about three to five females habitually um, nest here. And um, they go over a pretty treacherous um, area. They don't have that living shoreline. They're going over a pretty rocky riprap to get there, but they like to um, nest in the flower beds of this condo complex. And um, as you can see from that right there, they like that flat ground. They like that like clear area. Um, but so from the three to five females who nest there, they nest about two to three times each year. So in total, about eight, nine times uh, throughout one year. And so the condo um, owners kind of ran their own, if you want to call it turtle watching group. Um, they would uh, alert the representatives from the project and we would come put nest cages on um, for the hatchlings and or take the hatchlings to bring them to a more like safe spot. But with that also locals would, um, if they saw like people walking their dog, just any walkers, anyone who was getting a little too close uh, for comfort, um, they would definitely alert them to be like, hey, turtle here, gotta go a different way. And so that's really important. Um, and they're there, they're able to see it from their homes, their community, and just their life on the water. And so it's a really important part of um, the aspect of living in Port Deposit with these turtles now. And so again, representatives cannot be everywhere at once in Port Deposit, but again, the locals are. And so having them be aware and having that knowledge of what to do really is super important in this aspect. And allows for like a better research, better understanding of where they nest, and also just better protection for them. Um, and then so next is being a presence in the town. And so this was a really also big part. Um, so in previous, or the relationship in the project uh, with the town is pretty well established by this point as it's now going on to 13, 14 years. Um, and so in previous years, there's been educational signs that's gone on the Promedon, which is the walkway up to Tom's uh, gas house. It's right along the water. And this was done in 2016. Um, there's also been ha having an outreach table at a couple of other um, town events, kind of like such as uh, the Marina Day, and then also having uh, cleanups on the living shoreline to have the community come and also have the project itself and having that established base. And so it creates that presence, creates a trust and just an understanding while establishing that relationship with the town. And so we've been able to gain information from the town. The town has been able to gain information from us. And so it really has been a good working relationship. Um, and so usually in um, with endangered species, living in an urban area typically doesn't go too well as resi residents can become wary of outsiders. They can have a lot of mistrust um, if they think that things are going to change. And with that mistrust, conflict can arise. And in this instance, it really didn't occur. Um, the town definitely did embrace this state endangered turtle and embrace that the project was here to help them. And so a quick story about that is in the early, early years of this project, there was an individual on the um, upper stream, so above Conowingo, um, that this individual was caught stealing traps um, because they weren't aware yet of the project itself. They, they didn't want someone to harm the turtles. They didn't want um, there to be, they, they understood the importance of the turtles. And so they wanted to protect them, but, in turn, like we are trying to help the turtles, and as the um, as there was later trust and later um, build up of that relationship, they they have the understanding that oh yeah, we are here to we are here to help the turtles, and so it's really a, a good part, and so we're in a better place. <laughs> um, and continuing on though, but um, our social media and networking aspect, and so. Um, this is also a really big part, especially now with COVID-19. Um, and so in previous years, there's been local news outlets and um, a lot larger ones, such as National Geographic, who have done stories, um, which has definitely reached a greater audience. And so increasing our presence in uh, COVID-19 has 
definitely been important getting that information out to a wider audience. Um, so while in our in-person vis visitation, research projects and the town events are temp temporarily suspended, um, the information about the turtles definitely still had to get out there. And so um, while our lives kind of got on put on hold, the the map turtles didn't. They they're living their life. They're living their turtle life. They do not know what's happening. And so we still had to get that information out there. Um, so within this past year, we really did address the COVID closures and then instructing interactions with turtles because they're still bound to happen. And then um, these platforms have been updated to be a little bit more user-friendly and a little bit more modern. Um, well, COVID definitely has, again, stressed um, a larger presence on social media. And so we have increased our um, networks that we're on. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And so our Facebook account is our longest standing account. It's been up and running for eight years now, for, since the spring of 2012. Our Instagram and YouTube accounts have been up since the summer of 2020. So not as much time. Um, these platforms are definitely in their early stage of reaching a greater audience. And so overall, we're reaching over 500 people on across all of our social media, but specifically um, 524 followers on Facebook. We're reaching 25 people on Instagram and we have an average of like 14 to 62 views um, amongst four different YouTube videos. So we're getting out there. Um, but our future path for social media is to create a little bit more educational videos um, and such as their diet, their habitat, um, to get people to know a little bit more about them. And, um, and then that brings to education. Um, and so this past year, um, we wanted to reach a little bit of a younger audience. And so we had planned to have Harper County Public Schools um, to come out and have a in-person field trip at the um, field station. But of course, with COVID-19, that definitely did not work out to plan. And so um, with that being on hold for the duration of the pandemic, um, sorry, um, these were definitely put on hold until the foreseeable future until this pandemic is, you know, at the lower ends. Um, so with that, we created, or I created actually, um, some virtual classroom experiences for these students. And so um, we wanted to reach out to that, again, younger audience. So I created um, a cute little craft that you can see right here on the screen, which is a movable turtle for our K through uh, second grade. And then from our third to fifth graders, I made a crossword puzzle and a turtle facts PowerPoint to go hand in hand with each other. And so they're getting to know a little bit more about the turtles and the environment they live in, what's impacting them, what they look like and all of that. And so again, with our social media, if we increase our educational videos um, to include diet, habitat, all of that, um, they're gonna also be able to access that from our YouTube channel. And so we're hoping to really outreach to a lot of people on that. And then I would like to leave you guys with a little cute map turtle song. And so I am just going to press this link. And this was done a little while ago. I want to say 2012, but it's a very cute video. Let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a map turtle, baby. Let me show you the way. Hey! I'm a map turtle, baby. I'll never lead you astray. You can get your GPS, you can do your garment away. Baby, I've got a rap for you. I'm my dear baby, my dear. 
directions all true. I would leave you lost and lonely if it's the last thing I ever do. If you have any questions, anything at all, please let us know. Don't be shy. Don't hide in your shell. Um, but thank you so much. Um, it definitely did show, that, like, again, the locals really did embrace their endangered turtle friends. And, you know, we're all in Maryland, so hopefully we all do as well. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Do you want to unshare? We can all come back together. Yes, there we go. All right, I'm rocking and rolling now with my Matt Turtle song. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nancy had a quick question, and I think um, the answer is no, but I'll get confirmation. Does the Matt Turtle exist in other parts of Maryland? Uh, yeah, the answer is no. Uh, they're found pretty much from Broad Creek down to the mouth of the bay, uh, in Broad Creek, in Deer Creek. Um, we get occasional reports from Elk Neck, um, and we don't think that they're, they're probably turtles that got washed downstream. We've searched down near Elk Neck several times to see if we can see a resident population. Um, there's a few right down um, in Perryville, as Lynn talked about. There's a, a, a few females that hang out down there and, and, and nest down near Perryville. That's about as far down river as we think we have you know, a viable population. And how did you get Exelon on board? That's a good question. Uh, very easily. Um, they're uh, required uh, by their license procedure to deal with the impacts of uh, their dam operations on state and federal endangered and threatened species. And once they found out about the map turtle in 2009, I think is when we first contacted Exxon, um, they very uh, eagerly contracted with us to do research, uh, particularly on these critical conservation issues that the dam operations were impacting. And they've been a very good partner. Um, uh, obviously, corporations can be, you know, usually think of as being, you know, not your allies when it comes to endangered species, but just like port deposit, uh, stereotypes don't work. If you have open people with open minds, it's amazing what you can get done when you don't just yell at each other. And uh, they've been a very good partner for us. There have been numerous students that have had their support from Exelon um, to finish their work. Um, lots of things have been done for the, 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 the turtles conservation and management status. And we're continuing that work. Um, you know, like I said, I had a meeting with them about this today. So was it that that's always been their historic range or is that where they are now? Did they exist in Maryland and other places? We have, we, we have all of their historic records and they probably were not outside of the Susquehanna River drainage. They might have been more uh, abundant down near Elk Neck uh, prior to, to recent times. But the difference is the abundance of the turtle. Um, they're, they're, I mean, we estimate our total population size here in Maryland. It's somewhere between two and 300 adults. And you may say, well, that's not too terribly bad, but I have a colleague who works on them in Lake Erie in Pennsylvania, and he can see two to 300 adults in one state park on Lake Erie on one day. So he could see the equivalent of our entire state population in just one tiny little corner of his state park. Um, these should be a very abundant turtles. And we think the combination of uh, habitat loss, the collecting, um, the change in the habitat because of the 
the dam. Um, all of this has had just or over years has had sort of a chronic effect on the turtle population sizes. Right now, we think that they're you know fairly stable. Um, our biggest recent concern, honestly, is invasive plants on the nesting grounds. That's a, a really serious issue. We have actually, believe it or not, predation by root systems on the eggs. It's a weird thing. You don't think of plants as being predators, but I can show you photographs of these root balls that actually grow into the nest chamber and actually kill the hatchlings by growing into the hatchlings. This is something called root predation. It's a common phenomenon in turtles that overwinter. And we're having an increasing problem with that um, because of the amount of invasive material. You know, Every time we have a flood on the Susquehanna River, you get these huge seed banks that get washed downstream and they get deposited on the nesting grounds. And the degree of the invasives and how fast they grow is just incredible. I'm sure everyone here you know, has seen this, um, but that's actually one of our more recent you know, issues that we're really concerned with um, is, is that impact on the nesting grounds. Um, Nancy asks, in that same area, um, are, the, are the map turtles the only endangered species? Are there other endangered species that inhabit that area? Exelon, as, as part of the relicensing procedure, has had to do detailed surveys for everything. Uh, obviously, they've got bald eagles, and they've got ospreys, and they've got, you know, some bird life. They've, their biggest issue among reptiles and amphibians is, is just pretty much the, the, the map turtle. They've done extensive surveys for bog turtles within their footprint of their operations and they don't have any bog turtle populations in there. Um, so their biggest issues really are map turtles and then shad, eels, um, and some of the other fisheries that they're having problems with. And now they're having problems with invasive fish using coming upstream and using their their fish lifts. If you guys have never, by the way, gone, you know, once COVID is over, I strongly encourage you to do the tour of the dam. It's really interesting. And they have these, these incredibly interesting fish lifts to take the shad up and the eels up over the dam and deposit them in the pond behind the dam. And unfortunately, last year, they got overrun with invasive catfish and um, what's the one, the snakehead. Uh, are actually using, they're riding along in the fish lift along with the shad. And so that's a big issue for them to deal with. So invasive species remain our, one of our big concerns. It's, it's one of our biggest issues, as is true for everybody right now, but certainly, you know, it, it's a big issue for us with the map turtle. Is there a specific plant that does the, the root predation? I, I'm embarrassed to say my plant knowledge is <laughs> not as good as it should be. We had, a, we had one of our plant biologists come out and identify it. He said there was nothing there that was remarkable. It was just typically what you would expect from a weedy area. But one of the things we're going to do, because we've had some recent winter floods, is we're going to have a, 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 a good plant taxonomist come out and do a nice plant study on our, our nesting sites to see exactly what's in there. Anybody else have any questions? Raise your hand. Unmute. Write it in the chat box. I'm looking for hands up. I tried to answer as many of the chat questions as I could um, from while, while Zoe was talking. The questions come up several times for volunteers and the answer is yes at Port Deposit. We are able to accept volunteers. If you've never been to our facility in Port Deposit, um, it's a terrific facility. This was built with a combination of state and uh, direct uh, contributions. It's a, a renovation of the old gas house, as Zoe talked about. It's a wonderful facility. It's it's just, I can't believe they let us in there. I mean, I would not let a herpetologist in this building. I mean, it's it's really, really nice. You could use it as, an, as a beautiful bed and breakfast. It's, it's that nice. We have the entire second floor, and during the summer, we need volunteers to help man the station, particularly on the first floor to talk to people about turtles and talk to people about what's going on with endangered species and the history of the town. And we're always short volunteers for that. So we didn't operate that, as Zoe said, we didn't operate that in 2020. And whether we operate in 2021 is still to be determined. We hope so, but normally it's open Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, starting May 1st and going through September 1st. And that's a great opportunity 
for volunteers to get involved. And we also do our use our camera uh, uh, game cameras to monitor the turtle nesting at that site during the same time. And so there's lots of opportunities for volunteers at that station. Again, assuming that we're open, which at this point, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, Rich, Brett had his hand up earlier. Brett, are you still have a question? <coughs> Yeah, I, I, I put it in the chat, but I can I can ask in person too. Um, so I, I just want, you look like just one of my students from herpetology. Oh wait, you are. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I um. So I I, I saw I, I know you guys mentioned uh, you know boats and kayaks, uh, kind of disrupting their their basking behavior. Has there been any evidence uh, you know of boat strikes, any uh, propeller scars on on any individuals? Um, I think I'd have to go back and search the database, but I think we probably have three or four individuals that we've noticed with a, a propeller scar. So yes, but at a relatively low frequency. Um, so the, 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 the thing what happens with the boats is they ignore people who are speeding. Um, you, you watch them and you know, you'll see a boater come zipping down and it'll go right past the rock where there's 15 map turtles and the map turtles don't even see them because they're moving too fast to be a predator. They just don't engender the predatory avoidance response. And then five minutes later, you'll see a kayaker come very quietly downstream, just sort of creeping along, stopping every couple of minutes to check out what's on the rocks. And the turtles immediately get alerted. You see their heads pop up and then they all as a group dive off into the water. So I don't remember that I had one of my students did her master's thesis on the disturbance level. She hasn't published it yet, unfortunately. But I want to say that it was about a six-fold difference in the disturbance rates between kayaks and and commercial outboard motors. I think that's the number I recall. Well, um, building off of that, uh, you know, you mentioned there are a few individuals that had had scars from propellers. Were they, you know, are there any patterns, you know, with males or females? I mean, I know you mentioned females were a bit larger. I don't know if they would stay out in deeper water. Yeah, more, there's, there's no pattern to it. Uh, the other problem with that data set is, is it's going to be biased because if the propellers are seriously damaging the turtles, we would never find them. So we're only finding survivors. We're only finding the ones that have recovered from a, a boat strike. If, if the boats were actually hurting the turtles and causing mortality, we would actually never know because those things would obviously be washed downstream and we would never see them. So it's a concern. Um, Unfortunately, most of the really heavy, um, you know, outboard motor mater uh, activity occurs in March and April, because that's when the shad are running and that's when the boaters are really out there. And also where most of our turtles are found, there are too many rocks for people to use motors. Um, and that's why the kayakers are, are there in, in more numbers. They can get into places, obviously, with much shallower water and a higher number of basking sites than the people who are using the, uh, the outboard motors can. Understood. Thank you. Any other questions? You can raise your hand or put it in the chat box. And Zoe, I found out about y'all through Facebook. So just that's a, a, a mark tick up for uh, the social the social media. And you've had all of these people here um, learning about map turtles and their homework, I'm giving you all homework, is to take this knowledge that you've been given, gifted this knowledge, and give it to somebody else. Spread the knowledge because what the world needs is more smart people. We need to all get smarter. And um, Dr. Siegel and Zoe has, have helped us all get smarter because if I look at the ones that have their camera on you all do look a lot smarter than you did when we started off this evening so thank you um, uh, Zoe and Rich for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us and now we're going to take that and spread it around um, it looks like you have a lot of interest in volunteers as well I'll, I'll speak for Tom because I've often known to do that uh, I'm sure that the Herb Club from the Natural History Society would love to help out as um, in a volunteer effort once COVID is, is done, maybe, you know, spying out for the, the nest or um, whatever needs to be done. I'm sure our folks would be excited to participate in a yeah. project like that. I, 
I responded to one of the, the the chats. If people are interested in volunteering, by all means, email me, and I'll keep everyone posted. I'll I'll, I'll assemble a group email, and I'll let people know what we're what we're planning. Again, the big issue is COVID, and you know, I'm, I unfortunately May first is our usual start, and I not optimistic that May 1st is going to happen, but maybe by July we'll have enough vaccines and everything will be back to normal. So, but definitely send me an email. I'll assemble a group email and, and keep people posted on what's going on with that. And uh, Lynn, thank you so much for what you're doing to protect the map turtles in your neighborhood. That is awesome. You are a, a model, <laughs> uh, model citizen, environmental citizen and we applaud you for what you're doing. Well, you're welcome, we're, we're trying. I never knew about them. We moved down here um, in 2018, vacation-ish type. Now we're gonna be here full time. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to do what's right for the environment. So we're getting a little pushback from some of the residents here, but well, anything I can do, any other we'll questions that you guys have, uh, I put my email up on the chat room. Uh, by all means, email me or email Zoe directly. I'm sure we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And I look forward to attending more of these talks and eventually getting out in the field with the Herp Club. All right, thank you. And then um, Tom, you wanna to say anything else? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. The, the Herp Club is certainly uh, here at uh, your disposal for volunteers. I'm sure we'll have plenty of uh, folks interested in that. We'll share the info on our closed Facebook page as well. Um, and at the risk of going too long, I think I saw a similar question in the chat. Northern map turtles have a wide range across the United States. Mm -hmm. Why are they so limited in Maryland? Was, was there a glacial event? Why are they just restricted to the Susquehanna River? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I do not have a, a ready answer for you. I suspect that given that they're are no large lake bodies except for Chesapeake Bay. So they don't have anything equivalent to Lake Erie to use and they need relatively undisturbed, unpolluted areas. Uh, you know how our rivers have been impacted. I mean, we're talking about rivers that, I mean, Port Deposit is a, an inhabited area, one of their major nesting grounds. It's been used by humans since the 1600s. So we have 400, 450 years of human impact in these areas much heavier than they do in some of the inland areas where you know they haven't been as impacted as think as greatly uh but it is it is curious it is a very limited distribution um it, it even based on the historical records it never seemed to be very far except down to elk neck so i don't have a very good answer for for why they're they didn't have a wider range except that obviously the habitat wasn't suitable thank you both uh for a great talk a lot of great information yeah, I need to go. So. Okay, folks, take care. And I hope to see y'all um, at some other programs. And don't forget um, herpetological footwear coming right. up next yeah. month. So that should be great. Um, everybody stay safe, be well, and we'll hope to uh, learn together soon. Take care. Good night. Thank you.